start record. Perfect. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Good day and, and good time really to you all from wherever in the world you're joining us. Uh, so my name is Hamed Ibrahimian. I'm the uh, EMI Dynamics Committee Chair. And we are very pleased to bring another seminar series uh, from uh, EMI Dynamics Committee. Uh, I have to acknowledge my co-leaders uh, of the committee, uh, uh, Professor Manolis Schatzis, Professor Yanis Kukyum Zuklu, and Professor Marianne uh, Guterres Soto, uh, who has helped uh, with coordinating and arranging these seminars. Um, a special thanks goes to Tisha. Thank you so much, Tisha, for coordinating these things. Also, a very special thanks goes to Mariant. Uh, Mariant is our DEI delegate of the EMI Dynamics Committee, and she has been, uh, basically, she has been leading the organization of this seminar series. So thank you so much, Mariant, for all your hard work and uh, all the coordination. I know that it's not easy to coordinate this seminar series. So uh, with that being said, we have two wonderful speakers today. and. Uh, the first speaker would be Professor Babak Mawani from Tufts University. And the second uh, speaker would be Professor Rodrigo Sarlo from Virginia Tech. Uh, we are going to have, uh, the, the, we're going to ask our presenter to uh, basically present their work uh, each around 20 minutes. We're going to hold the question until the end of sessions. Uh, and uh, the last 20 minutes of the session will be dedicated to Q&A to both the speakers. So please hold off your questions until the end of the session. Meanwhile, you are welcome to write down your question in the chat box. Very good. With that being said, I will give the podium to our first wonderful speaker, Dr. Moaveni from uh, Tufts University. Bobak, please take it away. All right, thank you very much. Great to be here. Thank you for the invite. Great to see good friends. Um, so the title of my talk is Instrumentation and Monitoring of Offshore Wind Turbines. I will talk about first where to put the sensors and then a little bit system ID and model updating, which I believe Rodrigo will um, build on that, input load estimation and fatigue life estimation. So the case studies I will show you here are um, the turbines of the first two offshore wind farms in the US. The first one was in Block Island in Rhode Island. Second one was in uh, Virginia, Seaval, Coastal Virginia offshore wind. And we also have a farm that we monitor in Europe, that's in the North Sea. We do different different kind of analysis. This one shows a list of things that we have done, but generally we do um, physics-based modeling and data-driven modeling and hybrid. <clears throat> so to do the monitoring, we mostly do um, digital twinning and model updating, and then from those updated or calibrated models, we try to infer what is happening or what is the performance, dynamic performance of these structural systems. So for offshore wind turbines, we have three types of information. So for most structural systems, we have the two top and the bottom ones, which is the structural details and the measurements of vibration measurements. For wind turbines, because they are rotating machines, you also need the uh, uh, SCADA, which gives you, for example, the yaw angle, the power production, the pitch of the blades, the RPM of the rotor, and so on. So if you want to do physics-based modeling and model updating, you need all three types of information. If you want to data data-driven, you don't care about structural details, but you still need SCADA and vibration measurements. And if you have all three, sometimes the physics base cannot catch all of the dynamics and nuances of what is happening. So you do the leftovers with data-driven, or you can do transfer learning. 
All right, so the first step is uh, to put the sensors on these turbines. So we use um, information theory to decide where to put the sensors to maximize the information gain. For example, if your theta is a vector of what you want to estimate or observe on these turbines, but you cannot put directly measure theta, you want to infer theta. So you are going to say, oh, I have a prior uncertainty of this theta. And then if I put sensors in location D1 or D2, I get different posteriors uncertainties. The one that gives me smaller posterior between the two is better. Now you repeat that for all possible location and number of sensors. And the one that gives you the smallest posterior, that's the optimal sensor setup. Now the question is, the optimal is always infinity. You put sensors at all locations. And of course you put sensors underwater that adds like half a million dollar to your instrumentation budget. You need dive team. You put it in the towers where the elevator doesn't stop. You need the rope team, that's a hundred K. So you need to include the cost for different setups. So you always also need to balance the cost and the benefits. So entropy is the information gain or the opposite of that. So you want your entropy to be small and you want your cost to be small, of course. So you come up with an objective function, which is the, let me see if I can put it here, combination of two. So W is the weight, the number between zero and one. So if you put one, it means you only care about the benefit. It means kind of like this, so this is a Pareto front um, plot. So every circle is one optimal sensor placement with a different W. For example, this W is very small, which means cost is important. So for example, 0 0.01. So because cost is important, my entropy is high, but we never choose <laughs> anything off that line. That is the front. So I say, you know what? You want to reach this, this much entropy, at least choose this point. Or if you want to go with this point, I can say, you know what? Why don't you compromise a little bit on your entropy and look at the knee? And then I save you half a million dollar, for example. So this is the type of studies that you need to do. And again, this plot, every circle corresponds to a different set of weights. Now let's say we did the sensor setup. We collect our measurements. This is the center setup on one of these monopile case studies. So we have 12 accelerometers, 16 string gauges, and we have the full SCADA data. And we have months of continuous vibration data. Now we break this data into 10 minute chunks. Every 10 minutes, we do a modal identification, operational modal analysis. What do we get? So every 10 minutes, I care about two main modes. One is the first mode in four aft, which is the direction of the wind. Remember these turbines, you have to have a um, coordinate system that rotates with the top of the turbine. Otherwise, you do not have fixed mode shapes. And then the direction perpendicular to the direction of the wind is called side to side. Now, I go ahead and do like thousands of identification for over months. Every day you have 144 data sets because you have 144 10 minutes, right? Okay, so let's say even if I have a month, I have more than a thousand data sets. And I do plot them for four aft natural frequencies and side to side natural frequencies. So this is four aft, this is side to side, just the first mode. And the colors are where, whether the turbine is idling, which means low wind or in operation. So when the turbine is idling, natural frequency is very constant, like 0 0.29. But when it starts to operate, Natural frequency, first of all, it gets stiffer. 
it's about on average 0.31, which is 10% increased in natural frequency. And it has a huge variability, which no existing multi-physics model can explain this. So there is no model in the universe can explain this. Let's get that clear. Now, side to side is very, let's say, steady. Less variability, idling and operating is the same. Same with the damping. The damping in side to side is all structural, less than 1%. Damping 4F during idling is structural, less than 1%. But then with wind speed, you have more aerodynamic damping, which because in system ID, we don't have any other energy dissipation mechanism, it basically lumps everything into modal damping. That's why you get like this 10 to 12% damping. Okay, but what if I want to fit a model to this data? I want to represent this. So what can I do? So we go to the model updating stage and we say, what can I change to represent this variability? So we go and say, what's the culprit for the largest uncertainty in general when we model? Soil springs. So this is the lateral and rotational. So the rotational is a function of lateral. So we fixed the ratio of rotational to lateral and update just two. But basically this changes K theta as well, in side to side and the K theta in the other direction. So we update for every single set of these data, 1K theta, 1K side to side, 1K for aft. So we have thousands of them and see how they change. Of course, we are structural engineers. We blame the geotechs for the uncertainties. They don't know what soil is doing. We don't know what soil is doing. Let's blame them for all of the uncertainty. So I change my soil springs and the model matches the data very well, of course. Every 10 minutes, I have one different soil property. And if you see, this is the soil's properties I get for thousands of data points. This is good. This is what my geotech friends, they said they can live with. 150 to 180 mega Newton per meter for the lateral stiffness. And it doesn't vary much, but this, they wanted to, they, let's say, they were not happy with this. So a soil spring or that kind of soil that goes into 500 has no justification. No geotechnical engineer will be happy to see this. Of course, I am getting all the aerodynamic stiffening and lump it here because I'm a structural engineer and I know that the Young's modulus of steel doesn't change that much. But the soil also doesn't change much. So we did the next step. We said, you know what? I could do multi-physics modeling, which basically would give me a line here, but still wouldn't show this. Like you can do open fast and you have a line, but still doesn't explain any of these variabilities. And this is not noise. This is actual variability of the effective stiffness. So what did we do? We said, okay, let's make this an open, an open seas mechanical model. I add an artificial spring and damper at the top to model the aerodynamic stiffening and damping. And let's say, right now I fix it. So I fix the value, I say, okay, it's, Two steps, one idling, one operation. Of course, you can change that assumption, but this is the first step. And for the damping, I say it's a linear function of power. This is the mean. Remember, this is probabilistic now. So I assume a distribution for K, and then the mean of K 
changes with RPM. This is idling, this is operation. And the mean of the damping is a function of power. By the way, this is Block Island wind turbine. Again, this is the instrumentation. We have sensors at different heights, strain gauges and accelerometers, and we have this data. Okay, so what do I do? I do an optimization. So let's say here I want my K and C. I could do basically do the same thing I did here, point to point updating. That's what we did for that soil spring. I could do that using Bayesian, basically estimate theta and its estimation uncertainty, which would go to zero, obviously, because I have tons of data. I could assume that there is an underlying mean and covariance for theta. Now, this will not go to zero. Which is good. The uncertainty will not be zero. Or I could also say, you know what? I'm not after these two. I'm after this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. So I do my optimization to estimate these hyperparameters that they define the variability of my mean and covariance. So if I do that and I do a prediction using my probabilistic model, at least it covers the extent of what we identify. So in the four aft, remember before four, four RPM, I have one K for stiffness. After that, I have a different K. And then I will have a larger distribution here. I have a narrower distribution here. So basically when I do a lot of predictions, it covers the range of black dots, which are the identified. And again, for side to side, this is narrower, Sorry. which is good. I'm happy. We have a probabilistic model, which represent reality. It's not very tight. So it gives the prediction something between here and here, but it's real. So I will not miss things. But again, if you tell me the RPM is eight, I can say it's between this and this, but I don't give you one answer. Moving on, the same thing for damping. Remember the damping, if your power is low, then you have this. If your power is high, you have this linear shape of the mean, but you see the covariance also increases with higher wind speed or higher power. So wind speed and power are not one-to-one. -one. That's why we went with the power because sometimes you have high wind speed, but the turbine is still idling, which means no damping. Side to side, it's a different scale, mostly less than 1%, which is structural. Okay, so we did <coughs> build our model that we are happy with. One thing we can do with this model is we can estimate the input loads. That's what the client wanted. So the developers of these offshore wind farms, they want to know what loads are applied from the wind and wave. But here we only looked at wind. So we, we chose a region three of operation, which the loads are predominantly wind. And then we estimated the input loads using the measurements, assuming a point load. So we know the location of the load. We assumed two point loads, one in X, one in Y, fore aft and side to side. We used um, two approaches. We used the augmented Kalman filter and the similar approach together with Hamid using a basically windowed recursive Bayesian. It's pretty much like augmented Kalman filter, but instead of point to point, you do it window by window. We also did a very basic assumption of what would be the load if I divide the moment by the height. So let's say I have measurement of the moment here. What would be the load here to give me that moment? Forget about the dynamics, so the quasi-static load. 
<clears throat> that's the purple one. So you see the two time histories are estimated. X is four aft, Y is side to side. The average of one, side to side is zero. The average of four aft is like six to, six to 800, depending on the wind speed. But again, we have two approaches. Which one is better, green or yellow? And we put the loads back to reproduce our measurements. And the one that was green now is red. Now this one is better. So if you have some metrics that overall we look at things, this is much better than the AKF. For example, I don't know, you can choose some portions that yellow is the data. But in any case, we showed that the, this window thing is much, much better than the AKF in this case. Then we can use that also for virtual sensing, which is to put that load on top and reproduce the, sorry, produce the measurement at one of these locations. So if we have one location underwater that we have measurements and we never used in any of the model updating or system ID or in the augmented Kalman, uh, in the window-based Kalman filter. So we just basically used it for validation. And this is the validation in side to side and for aft. And it's pretty good. You remember this is a complicated structure under very, very heavy wind and loads. And um, we basically reproduce this sensor measurement. Now, the problem of that method that I just showed you is that this windowed based thing, it takes very long time to run. You cannot do it in real time. You cannot estimate the wind load for a year of data. I have a year of data, but I cannot estimate the wind time history for one year of data. It takes me like many, 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 many hundreds of hours. If I want to run point by point one full year. So what do I do? I do neural networks. I say I have a decent model. I do step one. I create a lot of input time histories. I create the sensor response. This is exactly the sensors that I have on actual turbine. I do a neural network, it's an LSTM, based on this to this to match, to basically estimate the input loads. Now, this has nothing to do with the real measurements. So of course it will not be a good network. Now we do a trick from transfer learning. Then I go and use the actual measured data and just tune the last layer of my neural network. Remember for real data, I don't have the actual input, but I can get it from the window-based recursive Bayesian, which is very expensive. I cannot do like, here I can do thousands of these very quickly, but this I cannot do thousands of time series. I can do a few. And this worked. So I can show you the example. So here, this is step one simulation. We just put a lot of inputs and outputs. We are in region three of the power curve. So we have like 700 minutes. So we train, this is numerical. Numerical input, numerical output, very easy to train. This is the training part. This is the testing part. Of course, LSTM should be able to do it. And it does, no problem, no biggie. But if I train it just here and I stop, and then I say, okay, go and predict the actual wind turbine input load. And then I do my Kalman filter or the window-based recursive um, Bayesian estimation, which is very expensive, they are very different. I treat this guy as the ground truth. So this is bad. My neural network is terrible. But if I do step two, I go and train this last, tune this last one or two layers. So the, the neural network is almost trained. We just touch a little bit of it using just eight data sets, 80 minutes because more than that, it takes a long time. 
Now, this is testing. This is not that 80 minutes. So we trained it on 80 minutes and then we went completely outside that range. We went to a different date, maybe two weeks after that and did a prediction of the neural network, which is fine tuned based on the 80 minutes of two weeks ago. And it does a very good job. Now this, it takes half a second to run for 10 minutes. I can do this for like getting a input loads estimation of one year of data that I have. So this is why we did that. Otherwise this, this guy, I was happy with. All right, one more topic I'll show and then I will pass it to um, Rodrigo. I think I'm at my 20 minutes, but very quickly. So we also did cycle counting for fatigue life prediction. So once you have these uh, virtual sensing and fatigue life prediction, so we compared what we get from one year of data. This is one full year of data. We extended that one year to 25 years, and this is what we get for the life. This is what the designers used for this jacket. Of course, they are more concerned. They didn't have any data. And one interesting thing we noticed is that most of the damage comes when you do start stops, like in April of 22, this is one full year. They did a lot of uh, maintenance. So they did start, stop, start, stop. So that's the most damage accumulation. Damage accumulation of one means you're done. Damage accumulation of one in a million, it means you can go one million years or one million times that month. But anyway, um, funding from Bessie Acknowledged, National Science Foundation and Mass Clean Energy, co-PIs of all these projects, Eric Anna and Usman for at Tufts, Chris Aaron from URI, Dave from the governor's office at Rhode Island, and Hamid, UNR, Jody and uh, Will from G Vernova helped us with the instrumentation, Orsted, Ben, Ross, and Ella from Copenhagen, Steve from the office in Providence, Dominion, Stuart, Kevin, Adam helped us with the instrumentation and data. Frank, Adam, Daniel also helped us with CVAL instrumentation. The instrumentations were designed by the NGI people and actually Stian came here, helped us install them. And then the people who did the work were Ming Ming was a postdoc Tufts. He's now professor at Tonji. Eleonora was postdoc at Tufts, professor at Northeastern. Azim, Bridget, Nassim, and Burak are um, current PhD students. And with that, I am done. You know, if you go offshore, you get a lot of cool sites. I have some videos, but I'll skip those. But see that beauty, that's like a nine footer great white. This is pictures taken from the platform on CVAL, by the way. And with that, I'll pass it to Rodrigo. I think I went 22 or three minutes. Sorry for that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Very engaging. And, and if we have time during the Q&A, we can see some videos. So uh, Rodrigo Sarlo, uh, professor, if you can start, we'll look forward to seeing your presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, can you guys see that? We're yes. Good. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thanks, Babak, for a fascinating presentation. That was that was quite quite exciting. And uh, I'm going to try to build on that uh, as best as I can. Um, no great white sharks, unfortunately, but we do have a T Rex. Um, so I'm going to do a, a a slightly deeper dive into this idea of um, system ID or modal identification using um, a couple of case studies from, from my past. Um, and hopefully this will be, or shed some light on, on some of the sort of interesting uh, limitations that we run up against when we do this type of ambient vibration testing and system ID. Um, so the title of the presentation is using mobile shaker trucks to perform modal identification. Um, what is a mobile shaker truck? It's the thing you see here on the right. Um, it's actually uh, used a lot for soil characterization, but what it does is, as you can see in the video, um, it can generate seismic waves that can be used to excite large structures. And as we know from, or if you're familiar with 
vibration testing of large structures, it's very hard to get them to move globally. And so we were interested in, in this idea of how this might help us or what would be the benefits of doing uh, controlled excitation this way. Um, so just a few words on ambient vibration testing. Um, hopefully most of you are somewhat familiar with this, but uh, just to cover kind of the bases and, and talk specifically a bit about the assumptions that go into it. Um, so if we have an instrumented structure, um, in, in my case, it's a building, um, we assume that it's excited by different ambient uh, conditions. So the more typical ones for us are humans walking around, doing things in the building, or wind, as was the case with Babak. Um, that generates a roughly random vibration response, which can then be processed using operational modal analysis to reveal uh, modal parameters over time, just like Babak did. Um, and then, again, building off of that, uh, one thing you could do with that data is pick a few modes, use those modes, compare it to some finite element model or other type of model, and optimize the properties of that model to match what you're seeing in real life. Now, the assumptions that go into this are quite are actually a few important ones. Uh, for one, what we assume when we do this is that the input PSD is uh, what we would call broadband wide noise. In other words, in other words, it's a flat PSD as you see here with frequency, right? So the the input is purely random, so you get energy in all frequencies. Um, on top of that, it's also uncorrelated, so it means that it affects each sensing location completely independent of any other. And you can start to see that these are obviously idealized assumptions because no input really behaves this way, but this is what we assume. And then finally, we assume also when we get to the modal analysis stage that we are sort of in a linear elastic regime and that'll become important as well. So I'm gonna to try to sort of push on these assumptions a little bit using some data from one case study uh, that we looked at, which is the, the Goodwin Hall building in Virginia Tech. So uh, if you're interested more in this case study, I'm, I'm putting some citations in here. Um, so looking at the long-term monitoring of this building over a couple of days, we can sort of track the natural frequency similar to what uh, Babak did. And um, so what I'm showing there at the top in the top plot I'm gonna try to, oops, try to use a pointer here as well. So here um, we see the first two modes of the building over time. Um, there are a few dead spots where we just didn't get enough excitation to really capture anything. But you can see uh, roughly how those two um, vibrational modes track over time. And then on the second plot, what I'm showing is the participation factor for each of these modes in terms of percent. So roughly speaking, we see that the first mode in blue at some point reached over 35% of the overall ambient response. And then down here, what I'm showing is the wind uh, speed as measured by a local uh, weather station. And so what we can start to do with this data is look at different sort of regimes of excitation. Um, we've got primarily wind here. Uh, we've got some wind, but mostly human excitation here. And how do I know it's human? Well, because um, it tracks exactly with um, the operational hours of the building. So this is essentially, you see it start to, you see to start the participation of the modes to rise around 8 a.m. and then peak around noon and then come back down around 5, um, 5 p.m. The dead spot here is because this was a weekend right here. So this was a, a windy, uh, windy Saturday, I believe, and then sort of Sunday, and then uh, we resumed on Monday here. Um, and then again, same thing here, almost entirely human excitation since the wind was very low on that particular day. And so what we start to observe is that uh, for one, we notice that when wind increases, we get um, sort of a dip in the natural frequencies, very slight, but we do we do see some changes in both modes. But I think more strikingly, we see that the participation of the modes is very different. So for the wind excitation, uh, the first mode plays a dominant role in the response, whereas for the human excitation, we see that both mode one and two 
sort of roughly equivalent participation. So that starts to indicate that there are definitely some differences in the way that these two excitation conditions behave. Um, it's sort of without knowing the inputs themselves, it's, di it's difficult to narrow down, but um, one thing we can look at is the direction of the wind uh, during these events. And it turns out that for this particular building, when wind speeds got above a, a certain uh, threshold, in this case, around 30 miles per hour, they seem to always come from the same direction, just based on the on the local conditions here in Blacksburg. Um, and so it turns out that they were always blowing in the direction of the first mode, which is the one you see on the left, uh, and perpendicular to the second mode, which is essentially a, a, a perpendicular bending mode. And so the deterministic aspects of the wind condition largely dictated what uh, the participation of each of the modes was. So that explains uh, some of the variability in the participation factor. And that's important because we start to see that obviously uh, the inputs are not as uncorrelated as uh, the assumptions would lead you to believe. Um, and effectively, if these effects are, let's say, um, pronounced enough or significant enough, we might get cases where we completely miss certain modes, right? So um, in this case, if the, the, the wind was sort of almost perfectly aligned or the conditions were such that only the first mode got excited, we might we might completely miss the second mode or, or additional modes. So there are there are some limitations, although you know I'm an ambient migration guy and I and I fully stand by the value of these uh these uh these techniques. I think it's worth sort of trying to understand where controlled excitation might be useful. Um there are various types of controlled excitation case studies in the literature with respect to buildings. Some of the most, um, I would say, notable are um, the eccentric mass shaker on top of the Millican Library. Um, there's been uh, several cases of deployable hydraulic shakers um, in sort of medium, um, sort of medium rise buildings. Um, and of course, there's the knee shake table, which citing Baba here by, by chance, um, which uh, was obviously a, a sort of a controlled shake table test of a high rise building. Um, in each of these cases, I'm gonna point out that the bandwidth runs roughly from one to 10 to one to 25 Hertz. Um, and generally speaking, you're able to identify around maximum 10 modes uh, in each of these cases, but they have some disadvantages, which we're trying to sort of complement with our technique. Um, Particularly, the two shakers are complex to install and, and generally don't get you a very high bandwidth. So if you're interested in high frequency modes for whatever reason, um, particularly if you're interested in sort of how, you know, floor vibrations might be or uh, just, you know, a high fidelity model updating, you might need higher frequencies. Those are necessarily not available during these techniques. And obviously the limitation of the shake table is that you can't move it to different places. So um, we were looking for potentially a more flexible technique. So that brings us to in situ seismic excitation, which is this idea that we instrument a building and then we use a seismic shaker truck to try to excite it. And, and again, the advantage is here that this is pretty mobile. You can just drive up to a site um, and excite actually in three different conditions. You have the vertical, but you can also using uh, this particular truck shake laterally as well in both directions. Uh, so you have a lot of flexibility in what you can do. You can shake from one side then go to another side and, and do quite a bit of uh, different types of tests. And in particular, I wanna point out the, um, the sort of force versus frequency profile here on the right. Um, and we note that it can sort of have maximum energy output between around 10 Hertz to up to hundred Hertz. So potentially really, high frequency excitation for a building, which um, is interesting to explore. So the research objectives here, hopefully I've motivated them well enough, um, are to first see if this even works, right? Are we getting enough energy into the building to sufficiently excite it? That was really the first question we had. And then if so, um, 
can we somehow use it to benchmark against ambient vibration analysis and see what the limitations are or what the complements of this technique are? And then can we leverage that high frequency excitation to identify modes that would normally be identified using traditional OMA? So we took a 11 story building in Texas. We instrumented using uh, 30 sensors um, and you can see the layout here. We had every two floors roughly uh, triaxial measurements um, on each corner of the building. So this is sort of a top plan view. Um, we've got each corner instrumented with a triaxial, in this case, geophone configuration. So we're measuring velocities. Um, these are actually extremely sensitive geophones, and that was really important. Um, the one exception I'll point out here is that in the roof, we just didn't have enough to measure the vertical direction, but everywhere else we were measuring vertical, um, vertical velocities. And since we are interested in doing input-output analysis here, we dedicated one station here at the base to actually measure the in incoming uh, seismic input from the shaker truck. So we had a shaker truck about 60 feet away from a, the ground station. And that's what we considered our basically input velocity, our base velocity. And so what we did is we shook the building in various directions. You can see the roof vibrations uh, from one of the sensors here. Actually, it's not the roof, it's one, one of the um, one of the upper floors, as we didn't have vertical on the roof, but it's one of the upper floors here. And you can see sort of the different responses to different directions of shaking. Um, but all, right off the bat, we can see that we could get a sufficient, a quite a significant amount of vibration into the building by using the truck. And then we can also uh, characterize the input spectrum by using that base sensor. Um, and we can see that just like the initial force versus frequency plot I showed, we start getting some excitation around five hertz um, and it peaks um, around 20 hertz all the way up to, we went about to 45, we weren't really interested in going beyond that. We can see we get a significant amount of energy into the building uh, compared to ambient vibration levels, which are the dotted lines here underneath. Okay. And we can do that in different directions. Um, as you can see as well. So the first step is just to compare uh, the, the output spectra for different conditions uh, to ambient vibration. Um, and I think this reveals some really interesting things. So I've eliminated the transverse uh, excitation results as those were not significantly different from, from uh, doing, sorry, not transverse, the lateral vibration results, as those were not significantly different from the transverse results. So I'm only showing transverse and vertical excitation from the truck. And um, I'm benchmarking that against the OMA spectra. Okay. So here we haven't done any modal analysis yet. We're simply looking at sort of the average spectra from all sensors. Um, as measured during during the tests. Um, and what we notice is that sort of we split it into three frequency bands. The low frequency band, which is characterized by no significant differences between the two or between the, the three conditions here. Um, that comes as no surprise since we have, um, essentially we had almost no input power here in this in this range. So basically this is all ambient. Uh, but as we move into the medium frequency where we had some uh, power when we start to see some differences. They're, they're very slight, but we do start to see additional peaks show up in the seismic excitation case that weren't there in the ambient vibration case. And then we notice that at about 11 Hertz for the high frequency regime, the ambient excitation uh, output essentially dies out. And you're left with these sort of peaks, which um, I'm not showing it here, but in the full paper, we go into depth. But these are uh, just using uh, uh, what's called kurtosis analysis. We can determine that these are primarily just harmonics due to different machines or different processes running in the building. They're not significant structural modes. Um, and we see a huge difference from the ambient to the sort of excitation case where 
we actually had a ton of additional energy going into the building, although relatively flat. And what this suggests is that there's not many global modes anymore, but rather just sort of dispersed local modes as we'll talk about later. Um, and we have confidence that this is indeed due to our shaking, just because if we look at the second plot, the coherence you know, above 10 Hertz is actually pretty decent. And so we have good confidence that we're actually getting energy into the building. So that answers our first question. Okay, now to answer this, the second question is uh, we needed to do some actual system ID. And so what we did is we basically took seven uh, tests of a hundred um, about 1,200 seconds each. And we run this through an output only stochastic system identification or stochastic subspace identification uh, technique, which is just a, a standard OMA technique. Um, we do that for the low bandwidth that, that consists of our ambient o OMA case. And then we do two tests with the vertical excitation using a chirp. So essentially going from uh, about five hertz to 50 hertz uh, chirp. And uh, we look at both low to medium frequency bandwidth and then high frequency. And for each of these sort of controlled excitation cases, we have 18 tests for each, okay? And um, we get a lot of modes out, actually an overwhelming amount of modes out, even for OMA. So for OMA, just between zero and 11 Hertz, we get, um, what is that, 15 modes. Um, and you can see some sort of typical modes that you would expect. You've got bending modes in both directions. So, so N corresponds to north, B corresponds to bending. That's our first code. So we've got an east bending mode here. And we've also got torsional modes that show up. Um, and then we've got, in addition, some stranger modes that start to show up, which is corresponds to vertical vibration of the, of the floors, which is not typically measured, but we see that even around seven hertz, we start to see vertical motion in the floors um, and sort of correlated across floors, which is interesting. Uh, we had another vertical mode here where all floors are sort of moving up and down together. So we start to see some, because of measuring the vertical vibration, we start to see some interesting behavior. Um, but overall, very good results even for OMA here, right? Finding 10 modes in OMA is, is, is really impressive. And this is primarily due to the fact that we had such sensitive sensors as well. Um, and then we're gonna contrast this with the chirp, uh, essentially, controlled excitation case where we're doing input-output modal analysis. So we have knowledge of the input. And overall, I'm not going to go through this, but we, we find um, essentially most of the same modes, except we find three, no, three new ones. By the way, the, the, the chart here on the left here, what it shows is a frequency damping curve. And so each colored cluster is the result from a separate test and we take basically the median damping case from each cluster and we that's our sort of representative mode so in the vertical case for low to medium frequencies we find roughly the same amount of modes but we find some new ones in addition to that so we find three new ones um and those are all really related to vertical directions of vibration which makes sense since this was a vertical excitation case and to just give you an idea of why this is interesting and, and important, um, here's a closer look at two of those modes. So again, I'm using that same sort of plotting technique where I'm plotting damping versus frequency. And we also calculated um, uncertainties for each of these modes based on variability in the, in the tests. And what we see is that for the... And actually, I'm, I'm missing a legend here, so I'll have to explain this verbally. So the, the triangle here corresponds to the transverse excitation condition. The gray circles correspond to the ambient vibration condition. And we see that these sort of result in similar, uh, similar estimated modes, right around you know, six and a half hertz with a relatively large degree of variability. As soon as we excite the building in the vertical direction, we actually get two modes at this frequency, which much lower um, 
variability in the results. And uh, particularly for the, the east uh, bending mode, which was actually estimated with much probability. So our understanding here is that by exciting this in a different direction, we're able to actually get not a more accurate picture because we're actually getting two split modes here, which were sort of merging into one before. And a similar case for another mode here. Um, and then last but not least, we went ahead and we did um, the vert same, same analysis, but for high frequencies. And this is where things started to get really interesting. We have essentially, we're able to start to locate uh, independent floors vibrating, right? Um, so we're able to get into local modes here, which different, uh, basically each mode corresponds to a different floor moving or doing something strange. Now, there's a big limitation here in the fact that we only had, you know, two, well, six sensors per floor. So it's likely that we're getting a lot of spatial aliasing here. We're not able to resolve the mode shape completely. So some of them look somewhat similar. Um, but just the fact that we're able to capture uh, these modes for different floors, these local modes, is actually quite impressive. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll end it here um, in the interest of time. I think overall, what we're able to see is that we're exploring a new method. Um, which gives us some, some advantages, uh, particularly the vertical excitation, we can excite modes that weren't excited by ambient vibration. That leads us to believe that the ambient vibration itself does not contribute very significantly to vertical motion, right? It's mostly lateral excitation, which is an interesting find. Um, we're able to see that the high frequency actually yields new information as well, local modes. Um, Another advantage was that we were able to conduct very short tests, which might be practical if you're concerned about avoiding environmental changes. And we have confidence in, in the excitation amplitude and direction, which is might be important in case, in certain cases, we're actually trying to understand modal participation in, a, in, a, in an input-output way. For future work, I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions, but um, we're looking to repeat these tests using uh, Longer excitations or excitations of 18 minutes led to very high variability in the results. And so we would like to cut that down by using longer excitation, particularly uh, using swept sign testing. And definitely, like I mentioned, trying to eliminate that uh, spatial aliasing by adding more sensors and doing modal analysis by floor to see if we can actually extract local floor modes uh, in the individually using this technique. Um, so. Hopefully, um, hopefully that was interesting. Um, we have uh, a paper that came out pretty recently with respect to this. So if you're interested in more details, um, I encourage you guys to check that out. Um, and uh, I guess we're on, we we'll have five minutes for questions. <laughs> well, thank you both uh, to both of our speakers. I encourage our participants to start writing their questions in their Q&A so that we can address them uh, to our speakers. Um, questions for both professors, Babakumaveni, as well as Rodrigo Sarlo. Um, and I will go ahead and uh, stop the recording so that people feel more comfortable asking questions, right? So.